So as the uh, offering plates are being passed, let me just go ahead and say my back does not hurt. Just for the reference, and I do use a brush or a comb in the morning. Um, sorry, Jesse, I just had to pick on you. Anyway, I'll pick on Charlie later in the sermon, so don't worry, everybody gets equally picked on around here, and they pick on me during the week, so it's all fair, I promise. But good morning, my name is Bart, everybody. I'm one of the ministers here. I am so very excited about this sermon series, and so I know you all are ready to hear God's word. Are you ready? Say ready if you're ready. Because let me just ask this, how many of you would agree that the way you do something or the way you say something matters a lot. Would anybody agree with that? I think most would, right? I mean, you can tell the truth, and you can do it in such a way that's, that it's ineffective and even rude. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but these kind of like crazy mean Christians, have you seen this, you know, maybe on social media or whatever, where they say the truth, but the way they say it, it's just, it's just mean. You know, it's like they say st- something like this, well, you are a sinner and Jesus loves you. It's kind of like what? You know, like, it's the truth, but no one's going to hear the message because of the way you're saying it. I mean, it's, it's like the least effective way to, to really say anything like that about Jesus because the way matters. Now, if you aren't married yet, don't worry because you will learn this. I've learned this the hard way. When Bridget and I first got married, it all depended more on my tone than anything else. Like, for instance, if she wore something and I was like, (laughs) are you wearing that? It meant something. Compared to if I said, are you wearing that? Because one led to a kiss and the other led to death, right? (laughs) Because the way we do things matter. And we have to make sure the way we do things is the right way. That is why we're getting into this brand new sermon series called A Better Way. Somebody say A Better Way. For this series is all about a better way, the better way. And to discover this better way, we have to know the way. So this series is wrapped around one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture, John 14, 6, where Jesus says something that should rock our world. It says this, you all help me out. I am the what? The way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me is what Jesus is saying here. Now as Christians, I don't know if you all have noticed this, but oftentimes what we have a tendency to do is focus on more of the truth part or the life part, or at least preachers like to talk about the truth. And the truth is important because we know that if you know the truth, then the truth will make you free, will set you free. And often we talk about the truth of Jesus, but rarely do we ever talk about the way of Jesus. Now, yes, Jesus is the only way to the Father, and that is very important, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and we should preach this But I think there's more. I would submit to you today that we also, as the people of God, that we need to look at the way Jesus lived and loved and spoke so that we would live and love and speak just like him, is that we are to be the way that Jesus was. You see, when people see us, they should see more of Jesus than anything else. They should see his way, the way. And so let's kind of have some fun this morning. Let's just kind of play a little Bible trivia, okay? One, one question, and if you know the answer, don't blurt it out yet. Let me ask you this question. What was the first century Christians called in the book of Acts? Well, let me give you some hints. They were not called Christians yet. They were not called religious people. They were not called Bible thumpers. They were not called Jesus freaks. They were called spirit-filled, Jesus-loving, demon-crushing, self-sacrificing, world changers. And according to the book of Acts, this is what they were called in Acts chapter 9. The people of what? The way. The way. It's fascinating to me that when you look at the way they lived, that their goal wasn't just to have the right theology. It wasn't just to be, have a strong morality 
but their goal is really to live, love, and speak the way of Jesus. In other words, before you, you come to Jesus, before you come to Jesus, then it's all about Jesus, the way. But once you come to Jesus, then it's all about living the way of Jesus. Amen? So really what it comes down to is that if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the way, then it's all about the way. And then once you become a member of the family of God, then it's all about the way Jesus lived. And so what we're going to do in this series is that today we're going to look at the way, Jesus, and what we need to do with that. And then the next three weeks after this, we are going to look at the way of Jesus and how we need to live according to what Jesus did. So because when you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see how Jesus lived, loved, and spoke, for we don't just need to look at the truth that what he taught, but we need to look at the way he actually lived, loved, and spoke. Because when we compare the way we live our lives, the way we love, the way we speak, how does it compare to Jesus? And unfortunately, in our culture today, there seems to be this huge difference, this huge gap between the way of Jesus and the way of his people. And so my prayer in this series is that we would close that gap, that we would not bring Jesus down to our level, but we would step up to the level of Jesus in the way that he lived, the way that he loved, the way that he spoke, that that is how we live, love, and speak. And that is why we are talking about a better way. And what you need to understand is that this series title came from one thing that my youth minister taught me. Now, he taught me more than just one thing. I had an awesome youth minister, but he just taught certain things that just stuck with me. And so I want to teach you one of the things that Chris Kiger taught me that stuck with me. And it's this, and this series is all about this, is that Jesus is the way... So his way is a better way. Make sense? So Jesus is the way, but his way is always the better way. A better way. You see, Jesus is the way, and his way is always a better way. And if you don't know the way, then it's all about knowing the way. It's all about knowing Jesus. But once you find him, then we need to live, love, and speak the way he does. So today we're going to focus on sharing with people around us the way. And most of the time we don't like to talk about that. For we not only believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, for we believe that Jesus is the only way. He's very exclusive. That he is the only way to the Father and the only way to heaven and so if Jesus is the only way and we have Jesus, then what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do now? If, if, if this is something that we really do believe, then what are we supposed to do with it, gang? Is, our, is there something that we're supposed to just tell our other Christian friends? Are we supposed to keep it to ourselves? Are we never supposed to speak of it or show anybody? No, no. We are supposed to not only not keep it only to, to ourselves, we are to speak of it. We are supposed to share. We are supposed to tell everyone about the only way. But unfortunately, research has confirmed that the longer that we are a Christian, the less likely we are to tell people about Jesus that don't know Jesus. And we need to change this. We need to not be a part of that statistic. For the biblical term and the common term is the word evangelism that no one really likes, if I'm honest. I mean, but oftentimes in today's culture, people of the way don't talk about the only way to God. People of the way don't talk about Jesus with the people that don't know Jesus because talking about evangelism usually brings up two emotions. These two emotions are guilt and fear is that Christians will feel guilty because it's like Christians feel because they know that they're supposed to get more involved in helping others know the only way to God, and they just don't. So then we feel guilty. The other emotion is fear, 
Many Christians feel fear because they don't like it or they, they feel like they're going to mess it up or that they're scared because they may say the wrong thing or that they, wanna, they don't want to push too hard. They don't want to offend somebody. They're fearful because they don't want to be called a hypocrite or, or they're just really insecure about talking about Jesus. And so many have this huge fear of sharing their faith, of sharing about the way, but have this situation where they know that they're supposed to talk about the only way. They're supposed to share the way with those that don't know the way. Because we have the way, and we have a better way because of Jesus. And so I know that some of you all may be insecure about sharing your faith. And I was too. I mean, I can relate. In fact, when I was in Bible college, we had this class that they took an entire month and just dedicated it to evangelism. And this class taught that you should memorize this really long script, right? This drawn out script to say to people. And if I'm honest, the only part that I can actually remember is the first line in the script. Are you ready for this? You're supposed to knock on the door. And when they open the door, before they say anything, you're supposed to say this. Have you come to a place in your life for you know for certain that if you were to die tonight, if you would go and spend eternity in heaven or hell? There was a lot more to it, but I can't really remember it. But in order to get a good grade on this assignment, we took one day the whole class and went door to door knocking on doors as my professor stood on the street with a notepad to grade us. And so I remember this. He said, whatever you do before you knock, you pray, right? Pray first. And we believe in praying first. And so would you like to know my prayer before I knocked? Lord, don't let anyone be home. <laughs> you know, it's like, Lord, I know you're good. If you're that good, please. But that really kind of messed up my viewpoint of evangelism. And if you have ever felt really insecure about sharing your faith, believe me, I understand. But we have to. Because we can point people to the only way to God. Because we have Jesus. So what are we supposed to do about it? Well, I think the Apostle Paul gives us a great model for this, by the way. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19, and I hope this will speak and inspire to you, this is what Paul says, is even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. And in verse 20 it says, When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. We'll jump to verse 22. And when I am with those who are weak, I shared their weakness. I connected with their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. And I love verse 23. Let's say verse 23 together, okay? I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Paul is saying, I do everything Everything I can, I connect with them. I connect with them to spread the good news. And for those of you that have the way, we need to share the way with the world. And we are to share Jesus with those who do not know him. We are to do anything short of sin, okay? I'll just go ahead and say that now. To spread the good news. And yet many of us don't. We don't. For you may feel a little insecure or hesitant. And what I want to do today is I want to show you four unlikely people that brought people to the way. And these four unlikely people, I think you'll really connect with. Because if we really believe that Jesus is the way, and so his way is always a better way, then we have to talk to those people that don't know Jesus. And when you see these four examples in the Bible, I believe that you're going to kind of say to yourself, well... They didn't really know very much. They, they weren't really that good. I can really relate to that. And when you see how God used them, then you might be inspired to recognize how God may use you 
to share the way with someone. So the first example is someone pointing people to the way as a better way is the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman. And she was the most unlikely person to share about Jesus. And what she can teach us, and we all can understand this, is that we need to invite someone to come and see. We need to invite someone to come and see. There are times where, where you're just going to have to say, hey, 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 come and see. Come and see for yourself what is going on here. Come, come and check it out, and the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest. Now, why was this Samaritan woman an unlikely person to bring people to Jesus? Well, she had three strikes against her. Three strikes. In fact, back in the day, in her day, Jewish men would literally pray this every day. They would thank God, and what they would thank God for is that they were not born a woman, a Samaritan, or a dog. Isn't that loving? I mean, that was just the mindset they had. And she had two of these. She was a Samaritan and a woman. You see, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And second, she was a woman, and so women weren't really thought highly of in that culture. And third, the biggest, the big problem is, is that, how can I phrase this with kids in the room? Um, so she kind of got around the block a time or two. And if, kids, you don't know what that means, just ask your parents. They'll be glad to fill you in what that means. But people would say that she was immoral, that that would disqualify her from God using her, and much less that she wouldn't even be loved by someone like that. And so one day this woman went to draw water out of the well, and she encountered Jesus. And, and this, this rabbi suddenly started talking to her. And she was like, wait a second, what's going on here? Uh, uh, why would you even talk to someone like me? And Jesus is like, hey, would you get me some water? And she replied, I can't even believe we're having this conversation. And Jesus said to her, well, if you knew who I was, then I would give you this living water. And this living water, you would never thirst again. So she was intrigued. Not only by the amount of respect that she was given, the kindness, but the offering of this, this living water. And then Jesus does what Jesus does. He asked her about her husband. And she got really awkward all of a sudden and replied, well, I don't really have a husband. And then Jesus looks her right in the eye and says, you're correct. You've had five of them, and the guy you're shacking up with now, he's not your husband. And then all of a sudden, she's like, uh how did you know that? You must be a prophet. Now, wait a second. I heard that there's this one coming who is the Messiah, the Savior. And Jesus is like, and I am that one. And when she recognized that, here is what she did. She was so excited in verse 28 of John chapter 4, the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone. And what did, she, what did she say? You all say the first three words with me of verse 29. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? And because of her, so the people came streaming from the village to see him. Now don't miss verse 29, gang. Come and see. Come and check it out for yourself. There is something different. There is something special. There's something better. Come and see. What did she not do? She didn't go, well, let me, let me, let me tell you about this guy named Jesus. Let me, let me tell you what, let me, let me tell you about him. She didn't go door to door knocking and go, hey, have you come to a place in your life where if you knew if you died tonight, where you would go, whether in heaven or hell. She didn't do that, did she? What did she do? She was like, come, come and see. You, you have to come and see the way, the one. You have to come to see a better way. She invited everyone that was around her. And the next verse tells us that many people came to believe in Jesus because he's the only way to God. Because she simply invited them to come and see and do you realize that you could do the same? It's not that hard. You can invite people to come and see. For I experienced this a couple of months ago when I went to Lowe's. 
I was in the gardening department, and I heard this woman that was like having multiple conversations with people. And you know, like when someone's loud, you kind of want to like get a little closer to see what they're talking about. <laughs> well, at least I do. I'm kind of nosy. Anyway, so all of a sudden, what I heard her say is this, oh, you got, you got to come to this church. It's just amazing. It's absolutely incredible. I've never experienced Jesus like this before. It's called Community Christian Church. And I was like, really? And she went on, you just have to come and see. I promise that if you will just come and see, then you'll see what I mean. And I'm standing there. And I didn't realize how close I got to her. And she looks at me and she goes, you, you have to come and see. And I was like, well, what's the preacher like? And she goes, he's short, bald, and feisty. But he spoke to my soul. And I was like, well, that sounds like my kind of a guy. What was I going to say to that? I mean, I wasn't offended because it's not about me. But she was inviting, just like this Samaritan woman. She was like, come, come and see, come and see. You have to come with me next weekend. Did you all know, did you know that three out of five people will come with you if you will just invite them to church next weekend? Three out of five, that's 60%. 60%. Three out of five people will come with you if you will just simply go, hey, come and see, come and see come with me. And if you can't get them to come with you next weekend, well then tell them to join online or tell them to come to the Candy Palooza for this is the very reason we do Candy Palooza because this is an outreach for you to reach your sphere of influence, to reach your sphere of friends and family and anybody else, coworkers and all that kind of stuff to help them connect to the church so they can connect with Jesus. But you know what we need to be like? We need to be like the Samaritan woman that just goes, hey, come, come and see. Come and see what God is doing. The second most unlikely person is a guy. We don't have his name, so we're just going to call him the blind man, right? Unfortunately, that's all we have. But this story teaches us the principle that sometimes all you have to do is share your story. That all you have to do is share your story. And this is what he did, and this is what we can do. Uh, just a little bit of his background, though, is, is that he was a poor man, and he was born blind. So you can imagine that his entire life was in darkness. All he saw was darkness as a kid, as a teenager, as an adult. The guy couldn't see anything. And one day, this guy named Jesus comes along, and he reaches down, and he grabs dirt. Jesus spits in the dirt. He makes mud, puts it on the guy's eyes, and he's like, hey, now go wash in this pool. And the guy does it. And amazingly, when the guy opens his eyes for the first time ever, he can see colors and shapes and trees and birds and clouds and people. And the guy gets really excited. And he goes around and he starts telling people, Jesus healed me, Jesus healed me. And then all of a sudden, the Pharisees didn't really like that too much. These insensitive Pharisees started debating whether he was actually healed. They were saying stuff like, well, this is not really real. I mean, this Jesus guy is a false prophet. And really, I mean, when it comes down to it, he's really a sinner. I mean, he couldn't really do this. These Pharisees tried to engage with this guy, but, but they were just trying to debate his healing. And they said, tell us who you think Jesus is. And he said, he's a prophet. He has to be. And these religious leaders refused to believe what this blind man said. And so much so, they even brought his parents in. And they didn't even believe him. And then these leaders called back this guy. And this is what he said to some of the most powerful people in that culture. John 9, 25. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But the one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. He's like, okay, this is my story, this is, this is me before Jesus, and this is me after Jesus. I, I, I've, been, I, I, I've never been the same since he came into my life. I mean, this guy simply told his story of who he was before and now who he is because of Jesus, and we have the same story. We have the same story of who we were before Jesus and who we are after Jesus, and that's how we can connect people to the way. Maybe your story may go, well, I was searching all my life and I just felt empty and I couldn't feel, feel that emptiness with anything until I met Jesus. 
Or maybe it's, I was hooked on this or that, but when I met Jesus, all of a sudden I was free. Or maybe it was my marriage was in big trouble and we were head down the road of divorce. And then we came to Jesus. And now our marriage has never been better. Or maybe I used to be in bondage of having four cats. And I met Jesus and now I'm free from cats. That one's Charlie. I had to pick on Charlie sometime. But you need to understand, gang, we all have a story of Jesus. And that story with Jesus is always a powerful one. It's a meaningful one. Your story with him is one of the most powerful ways that you can bring people to the way. No matter what your story is about, when it's about Jesus, it matters. It's an incredible story. It counts. Your story matters. And you can tell your story in all sorts of different ways. I mean, you can start in a conversation if you want to. Or maybe if you're a boss at work and you kind of bring your employees together and you kind of say, well, let me tell you why God is blessing our business right now. And you can tell your story. Or you could offer, you, you could actually have a Bible study at work or at school, and you work in Jesus into that, and your story into that. Or if you're a musician, you can put your, your story to music. Or if you're a student, you can slip your story into a writing assignment in English. I don't know. But you can say, here is my story of what God did, because this is who I was, and this is who I am now. Just share your story like the blind man. Share your story on face, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever social media you use. But we need to be like the blind man and share our story. The third unlikely person in Scripture, and her name is Dorcas. We went over this a few weeks ago. But anyone with the name Dorcas is an unlikely person to bring people to Jesus, unfortunately. But she teaches us the principle of this, is that we serve to save we serve people to save people. In other words, we share Christ by simply giving our life away by serving others. It's that simple. And here's a great description of Dorcas in Acts chapter 9, verse 25. It says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. And she was always, what? You all help me out. Doing what? Good. And helping the poor. Now, let me unpack this for a second, because she had a burden on her, because when she found Jesus, when she found the way, she wanted others to find him as well, and there's no other better way than serving them. And so she served them. She served them. She served the widows, because in her time, the widows really didn't have much right. They didn't have many rights. I mean, when the husband died, his possession did not go to the widow. It went to the firstborn son. And if it, they didn't have a firstborn son, then it went to the husband's closest relative that was a man. So most of the time, widows had nothing. They were kind of left high and dry. So these widows literally had no means to support themselves. So Dorcas would come along and serve these widows. And what did she do? She prayed with them and she served them. She made them clothes if they needed clothes. If they got them, got, she would get them money if they needed money or food or anything else that they wanted. They loved her because she loved them, because she served them. She showed them the way by serving them. And here's what's so amazing, is that her ministry was so valuable that when she got sick and died, you can read this in Scripture, it's in Acts chapter 9, God raised her back to life. This is how valuable she was. She was so valuable because she got involved with the lives of people and pointed them to the way. And there are too many Christians that today seem to just do kind of a drive-by witnessing. You know what I'm talking about? Where it's like, we don't really get involved in their life, but what we do is we're like, oh, hey, what do you need? Okay, yeah, here, let, let me give you a, a Jesus platitude, and then here's some money, have a good day. You know, we don't actually get involved in their life. We do this kind of drive-by witnessing. And what did Jesus do? Jesus always got involved in someone's life. What did Dorcas do? She got involved in so many people's lives that she was able to point people to Jesus because she served them to save them. But let me give you a warning. When you do this, the person you're serving is going to mess up because they're going to mess up because they're not perfect. 
Are you perfect? I'm not perfect. But so just keep that in mind. They're going to mess up. And what they actually need is your patience, your love, the truth. And we need to speak Jesus into their lives. And we need to stay involved and help them to the point that they see a better way. They see the only way, which is Jesus. And I'm telling you, the easiest way to share Jesus is to invest in someone's life, to serve them, to save them. And so sometimes we need to point people to Jesus by saying, hey, come and see. Share, let me share my story or let me serve you deeply. Or maybe the fourth unlikely person that pointed people to Jesus was the Apostle Peter. And he can teach us to be bold, that there are just some times that we need to confront in a loving way in the name of Jesus. That we can confront in a loving way, gang, not a hateful way or a weird way. What did I say? In a loving way. A loving way. <laughs> you can still be truthful and loving at the same time, but don't be hateful, don't be angry, and don't be weird. Because let's be honest, there's plenty of those around. But we can be bold and trust that the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest. For Peter was unlikely because Peter betrayed Jesus three different times. And the first time he betrayed Jesus, when he denied Jesus, it was to a little girl. A little girl. That said, hey, don't you follow Jesus? And he was like, nope. I don't do that. And then all of a sudden, this guy starts speaking boldly to a group of people about Jesus. And God chose him out of all the other apostles to preach on the day of Pentecost. And what kind of message did he preach? Was it a message of, hey, I just want you to feel good. I want you to always have the best parking space at Walmart. Because if you just think positive thoughts, positive things will happen to you. Did he preach? It's all about your health and your wealth, right? And smiling preacher. Anyway, did he preach that message? No. What did he preach? Peter literally preached, you all are all sinners and you killed the Savior. That's bold. And you need to turn to him because he came back to life for you, for your sins. You see, Peter spoke up when God gave the opportunity to pop up. And Peter said this in such a way that everyone was convicted. They weren't offended. They were convicted. They were not condemned. They were convicted. And then they're like, well, then what do we do? And I love this verse, Acts 2.38. Peter says this, repent, which means turn away. Turn towards God. Turn away from your sin. And be what? Baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there will be times that the Holy Spirit of God will prompt you to be bold, and then it will be time that you can speak boldly to people to point them towards the way. Now, let's acknowledge that we are not supposed to be angry street preachers with bullhorns who are bitter, angry, and speak lava over everybody. We are not that. It's when God prompts you to say, you know what? I love you and God loves you. But you're a sinner. And you are in need of a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. He is the Messiah. He died on the cross for you. He came back to life for you. So that you can not only be connected to God, so that you can get forgiveness of sins and you can get the gift of the Holy Spirit. I mean, what would Laurel County look like if we all did that? What would your work look like or your school look like? Because, let's be honest, if you have the way, then our job now is to share the way is a better way than what they're currently doing. For you may have a friend or a family member that you need to speak boldly to about Jesus. You may have a coworker or a classmate, but listen, we don't do this in anger, bitterness, or jealousy. We speak boldly from a place of love and truth. We speak from a place of Jesus, a place of help. And it's okay to have that spiritual conversation with people. We just treat it like Jesus would. Now, I am concerned because so many Christians today 
They're just kind of like, hey, come here. Let me tell you everything you're doing wrong. And here's seven steps to get out of it, to have a better life. <laughs> and not point them to Jesus. But that's not us. For we believe and we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. And what do we do with this? We bring people to the way to show them a better way. We show them the way by telling them, by saying, hey, come and see. Or we tell them our story. Or we serve them to save them. Or we are bold. And what I want to end with today is this question. Is which approach do you need to take this week to bring people to the only way to God? Which one do you need to do this week? To come and see? To tell your story? To serve? Or to be bold? Because I promise you, if you will step into this, God will provide an opportunity for you to do this. So which one will you do this week? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for what you have done for us, that you have provided a way, because the way is your son Jesus, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we understand because he is the way, that his way is always a better way. And so, Father God, I pray that we would be the kind of people that we just can't contain this, that we can't hold on to this, that we can't keep it to ourselves, that we would go from this place and that we would go and tell people, hey, come and see, come and see. Or that we would share with them our story or we would serve them to save them or just be bold in their life in, in the Jesus kind of way. And so, oh God, I thank you that you have given us this task and that we are your plan A and you do not have a plan B. So I pray that we would take this and that we would spread in Laurel County that your son is the only way. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who he is and what he has done. And we can only come before you because of who he is and what he has done. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So what we want to do now is just do something really simple. Is we just want to give you an invitation. Is we want to give you an invitation because if you have not come to the way, if you have not come to Jesus and accepted him as your Lord and Savior and been baptized into his name, then all your life is leading up to that moment, to the way. Because Jesus is the way. So this invitation is for you to finally come to the way. Or maybe you did at one point and you started living the other way. <laughs> and you realize now it's time you rededicate your life and come back and rededicate to the one that died for you, that came back to life for you, that is the only way to the Father. If that's you, won't you come? Or maybe you just need prayer. Whatever it is that you need to do, whatever next step you need to take with Jesus, I can guarantee it's the first step out of the pew and down this aisle. So won't you come as we stand and sing? Let's stand.